1963, a set of photographs recorded some most unusual friendships. They featured the most popular peer of the day and the man who would become Britain's most notorious gangster. There was a third man, also a gangster, and the lover of a senior Labour MP. And a fourth man, a cat burglar, and lover at the pier. The strange liaisons captured in the photographs straddle high life and low life. Exclusive society and the underworld. Rumours about these connections reached Fleet Street and in the summer of 1964, a Sunday newspaper ran a sensational story. The stage seemed set for scandal. But the political establishment rallied round the pier. With the help of some influential friends, he denied the story and the newspaper was forced to withdraw. The pier collected a huge sum in damages. The gangster embarked on four years of criminal mayhem. Tonight, Secret History tells the remarkable story of the scandal which got away, and of the love that in 1964 dared not speak its name. The peer in the photographs was Robert Boothby, one of Britain's most brilliant public figures this century. In 1924, when he was just 24, Bob Boothby was elected to Parliament. He was the up-and-coming Conservative MP of his day. As a young parliamentarian, Bob Boothby had it at his feet. Attractive, good speaker, naturally talented. And at that point, it looked as though nothing really was beyond his grasp. Boothby rose quickly. In 1926, he became Parliamentary Private Secretary to Winston Churchill, then Chancellor of the Exchequer. Many people thought he would, was destined to be Prime Minister. He was very good on economics. He was a Keynesian. He followed Keynes. Uh, and uh, he was, seemed to be destined for higher things. But he, but he did have one or two flaws. One of Boothby's flaws was an overwhelming desire to embroider the facts. Bob found it very, very difficult to tell the truth. And very, very often, with them, it wasn't just because he wanted to hide some inconvenient fact. And there were all sorts of, you know, types of lie, which, you know, I would be once named for years and just accept, and some were rather endearing. He had a great gift of exaggeration. Uh, he went to see Hitler in Germany and got an audience, whatever they called it, with Hitler. And uh, he told the story that when he went into Hitler's presence... As I got up to him, I was pretty frightened, because I knew he was a fairly formidable character. He rose to his feet, clicked his feet together and said, Hitler! And I, for once, rose to the occasion and I clicked my feet and I put my hand up and said, Boothby! <laughs> Quite untrue. Not a word of truth in it. Despite the tall story, Boothby saw through Hitler earlier than most and was an outspoken critic of appeasement. But his political far-sightedness was dimmed by recklessness. He was an habitué of the casinos and constantly ran short of funds. A problem over money would lead to political disaster. After the Nazis invaded Czechoslovakia, Boothby agreed to help some Czech emigres get their assets out of the country. He campaigned on their behalf in Parliament, but failed to declare that he was to be paid a commission on any assets which were recovered. In 1941, a parliamentary committee headed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir John Simon, found Boothby guilty of misconduct. I remember asking him at Oxford, I said, what did, did happen? And he said, I fibbed to Sir John Simon when asked, do you have an interest in the Czech assets? Well, well, why did you fib? Oh, I couldn't stand Sir John Simon. Churchill had appointed Boothby to his wartime government as Minister of Food, but now insisted he resign. Boothby never forgave Churchill. What I did say at the time, and I made a speech in the House of Commons, is that I admitted no guilt of any kind except 
the guilt of being a gambler, which I am by nature, and I've stuck to that ever since. And of course, that's what saved me, because I couldn't have survived if I'd been guilty of anything beyond that. Sir Robert Boothby and Mr. Rafe Asherton take a trip along the Parau River during their tour of Malaya. But though he remained an MP, Boothby never held office again. Instead, after the war, he became the political megastar of the new age of television. Very few of the Tory party were articulate or understood television. So in the world of the blind, a cockeyed man was king. And Bob was his wonderfully wavy hair, which he used to sweep back in a rather dramatic way. And his fluent tongue uh, enjoyed a new life. In the news, a fortnightly discussion... Boothby's leading role in the first TV talk shows made him one of the most famous men in the country, always armed with a provocative remark. There is nothing more boring than a news bulletin on the BBC unless there happens to be a world war raging at the time. It is His star status aroused envy. I used to hear Conservative MPs say about him, uh, he's a bit of a cad, you know, he's a bit of a bounder. I once said to him, I once said to him myself, I said, I know, Bob, you are a bit of a shit. And he said, well, a bit of one, but not entirely. <laughs> Those in the know had another reason to disapprove of Boothby. Along with his lying and gambling, he was marred by a third flaw, an uncontrollable urge for wide-ranging sexual adventure. When Bob had been in Maudlin, he was nicknamed the Palladium because he was twice nightly. And I remember repeating this to, to Bob, and he said, uh, I, I assumed rather naively this meant girls. He said, oh no, girls never were in Oxford. They were strange creatures who sort of took over the place for command balls. He was bisexual. I mean, this I know, the family knew this. I mean, he told me on many occasions, he said, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, he told me on many occasions that he was. I'm not sure if I like the boys better than the girls or the girls better than the boys, he used to say. Certainly he, he was um, a purely homosexual, I suppose, until he was about sort of 25 or something. And um, he then, I think, took quite a long time to actually st um, start having affairs with women. He told me this, and he said, you know, I've never been to bed with anybody, a woman, except a prostitute or a married woman. Boothby's most enduring heterosexual affair, which lasted over three decades, was with Lady Dorothy Macmillan, the wife of his Conservative colleague, Harold Macmillan. Lady Dorothy always surprised me as being his great love of his, great love of his life because she, he was a very dapper man. Uh, he dressed always very neatly and he had tidy little shoes, tidy little feet uh, and always very neat shoes. And uh, he, 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 he was... Um, um, presentable and Lady Dorothy was uh, perfectly presentable but she was rather horse-like if you know what I mean and she had huge hands like hams and a little bit of a you know here and and uh, I, I once said to him how surprised I was that it it was her and he said uh, he said he admitted it and he said well that's the way it is I, I just happen to love her. In an effort to achieve respectability Boothby decided in 1935 to marry. The woman he chose was Dorothy McMillan's cousin, Diana Cavendish. But from day one of the honeymoon, it went horribly wrong. He felt trapped with this sort of woman there for life. And when they got to um, Rome, um, they had a fairly uncomfortable sort of night. And Bob, without much sleep, came down early for breakfast. She didn't appear. He went up the stairs and found Diana coming down. I've got joyous news for you, she said. Um, Bob's heart absolutely sacked. My God, is she pregnant? Um, it's all right. I've got the curse, so you needn't fuck me anymore. Physically, I think he was rather frightened of women. Emotionally, I think that um, men did matter very much more to him. And some sort of younger man who he could sort of you know, establish a close relationship was um, very, very important.